My name is Greg Milne and I'm a PhD student at the Royal Veterinary College, which is a University of London. Today I want to talk to you about some recent research that we've done uh, on a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii, which you can find the, the paper here below. Um, and it's about uh, the roots of infection, so how a parasite is transmitted from, from animals to the environment and to people. Um, so for those of you who don't know anything about this parasite, um, it causes a disease called toxoplasmosis in both humans and in animals. Um, and most of the time when you're infected with the parasite, you won't know about it because you don't show any symptoms. Um, but it tends to be most apparent uh, in people who have immune system problems. So if you have HIV, for example, um, if you have uh, just recently had an organ transplant donor and your immune system is being suppressed by drugs. Um, in these people, infection can be very severe, and for example, you can get uh, brain lesions in HIV patients. Um, but first, let's just see a little bit about how the parasite is transmitted. So if we just take a look at the um, transmission diagram over here, you can see that um, the definitive hosts, so these are the cats and their wild relatives, they harbour the sexual stage of the parasite. So what I mean by that is that they're only the only animals in which the parasite can reproduce and they do this within the small intestine of the cat and so an affected cat will shed these uh these ursus the sexual stage parasite in their feces and these ursus um, contaminate environments and soil and water um, and they can infect animals or humans who accidentally ingest them so this could be for example in grazing pasture or in contaminated drinking water um, unwashed veg, all sorts of things. So that's one route of infection. Uh, the second major route of infection is um, by a stage of the parasite called the bradyozoite. Um, so if an infected animal is eaten by another animal, um, infection passes from one to the other. And this is because that, uh, the infected animal harbors what's known as bradyozoites in the tissues. Um, these bradyozoites are a part of this structure called a tissue cyst. Um, and once the meat is eaten, so in the case of humans, if you don't cook the meat properly, or if it's eaten raw, for example, um, these tissue cysts release bradyozoites um, and establish an infection in the new host. So we have these two routes of infection. We have ursus on the one hand, and we have bradyozoites on the other hand. And another source of infections is actually from mother to child. So if a mother is infected um, during pregnancy, then the parasite can actually cross the placenta to the unborn fetus and cause what's known as a congenital infection. And in some of these cases, unfortunately, this can result in abortion or stillbirth. Um, but if the baby is brought to term, it um, can also cause a variety of different brain and, and eye problems, so sight problems and uh, problems with development as well. Um, but the key question that I want to talk to you about today is that these two, uh, these two roots from cats, the ursus, and from livestock, these bradyozoites. So an important question is what proportion of infections come from these ursus root or come from this bradyozoite root? Because if you think about it, if we don't know where the infections are coming from, how can we lower the number of cases in humans? And to get to grips with that question, what we really need is some sort of marker of infection that tells you this person has been infected by this route or by this route. And we actually do have that. So let me just talk to you a bit about how we can find that out. So as I said before, cats um, shed ursus in their feces. And these begin as unsporulated ursus, which just means that they're an early developmental stage. They're not infectious if they're consumed. Um, and these sporulate over time, so over a few days they become infectious while they're in the environment still. And for anyone who ingests these unsporulated ursus, um, so for example a person, um, the parasite wall kind of breaks down and these uh, sporozoites are released from within these little um, walled areas within the sporulated ursus. And you can see here on the diagram that there's this little kind of almost V-shaped, Y-shaped um, figure above the sporozoite. And this is representing uh, an antibody. And so what, what I'm showing here is that 
the human body mounts immune response um, against the sporozoite. And this is useful for scientists because it tells us, um, gives us a marker of infection, and it tells us that this person has had an Ursus infection. So we can detect whether someone has an Ursus infection by detecting these um, sporozoite specific antibodies. But one of the problems is if we don't know how long the antibodies are persisting in human blood, which we didn't, then how do we know how useful the test is? I mean, if the antibodies are very short-lived, you could test for it and then not find any of it, but we don't know whether that's because uh, the antibody isn't there, because they haven't been infected by an assist, or just simply because they're very short-lived antibodies. So that's really what we wanted to ask. How long lived are these antibodies? And we were able to do that by collecting some already published data, um, which was actually collected in, in a very endemic region of Brazil. So they have lots of um, toxoplasmosis in this part of, of the world. And you can see the map over here. So on the kind of southern eastern corner of Brazil, this is where um, two ind uh, independent studies were conducted. And they had two aims. So the first was to collect data on the, on the prevalence of this, uh, of this sporozoite specific antibody in, in human populations. And by prevalence, I mean the percentage of people with the antibody. Um, and the second aim was just to collect information on uh, another antibody, but one that doesn't tell you anything about the root of infection. So we'll just call this the non-root specific antibody. So it doesn't doesn't tell you whether you had an Ursist or a Bradyozoite infection, it just says this person has been infected by T. gondii. Um, and they sampled about 400 or more than 400 people, so a fairly substantial number of people uh, from their teens until their kind of mid to late 50s. And using this information, this published information on the prevalence of these two antibodies, um, and also creating a mathematical model of how antibodies change after infection, we were able to try to estimate what um, the length of duration or like how long these, anti these sporozoite specific antibodies are persisting for in human blood. Um, so if I just show you a bit firstly about um, how the model performs. So you can see on the figure over here that um, on the, the bottom axis you have age, in years, so from teens until kind of late 50s or so. And then on the vertical axis, you have the prevalence of the sporozoite specific antibody. So the one that shows you uh, is a marker of Ursus infection. And so if you look, for example, at uh, about 25 years old, the gray point and the error bars around it show you the data. So in this case, in this second point, it's about 60% of people have had um, an Ursus infection at some point. So grey points show the data collected in Brazil, and the black line with the black triangles show the model estimate. So this is kind of what we predict using our model. And the grey shaded area around the black line is uh, equates something to like the uncertainty in our model estimate. And the take home really is just as simple as, well, the model does a good job of predicting the data. And that's important to know if you want to trust our later predictions. Um, but really the meats of the project is, or indeed was, um, what is the duration of this particular um, sporozoite specific antibody? So the one that tells you whether you've had an Ursus infection. And so that's when this next graph comes in over here. So you can see, um, it might seem a bit daunting at first, but it's actually quite simple. So Along the, the bottom axis, you have the antibody test performance. So this tells you something about um, how good the test is at detecting the particular antibody. So it could be, for example, that the test is very poor, has a very high false positive or false negative rate, or maybe it's very good and it has very few of either of these. Um, but if we don't have the specific values for this, um, then any estimate we have on the duration of the antibody in blood might be quite biased because we're making assumptions about how good the test is. So it's kind of equivalent to saying, well, for all these different estimates of, or guesses really of how good this antibody test is, 
what can we predict about the um, duration of the antibody response? So yeah, that's on the vertical axis. So you can see in years um, how long the antibody is persisting for in human blood. Um, and if you look across the center of the graph, so where all the data are, uh, the back black points show you the central estimates for the, um, for the model predictions. And although they are quite variable, um, they're all within quite um, a high region. So, I mean, 10, 20, 30 years um, of an antibody response, um, with, obviously with some uncertainty. So those error bars on either side of the points tell you something about how uncertain the model prediction is. Um, so it roughly equates to that. But I think the main take home is, is that the antibody response for these ursist um, at specific antibodies, it's actually quite long and that's really good news because it means that we can actually go into a population, we can sample lots of people, we can take their blood, um, sounds a bit vampire-esque there, but we can take some of their blood and then we can, we can test it for this particular ant antibody and then we can ask, well, what proportion of people have an ursus infection? And that isn't just standalone information. I mean, we can use that information to inform local public health control interventions. Um, and for a disease that can have pretty awful consequences, particularly amongst uh, pregnant women and their babies, I mean, I'd say that's quite useful because you can, you can inform local specific control interventions. Um, so I think I'd just like to thank uh, my funders. So the BBSRC, uh, LIDSI, um, the LIDO program, who I do my PhD with, um, and our partners at the London Centre for Neglected Tropical Disease Research, and lastly, but not least, uh, BioRender, who I um, design lots of these amazing figures with, and of course, my supervisors, uh, Dr. Martin Walker and Professor Joanne Webster. So thanks very much for listening. Well, I came to science quite late, so I guess it was only when I was maybe 16 or 17 that I really considered science as an option for, for a career. Um, I really loved biology um, at school. Um, but I guess, yeah, when it was maybe when I was doing my undergraduate degree at the University of Bath, um, I had this really great series of lectures, you know, people coming in for external talks. Um, one of them was from Public Health England. Um, and they gave a great talk about uh, the public health response to the Ebola outbreak in uh, West Africa in 2014, I think it was. And I remember just thinking that, well, this is something I could really get on board with. Like, not only are you you're doing something that is quite fascinating, you're learning about uh, potentially a new, new infection, a new outbreak or something like that. You're also contributing some good to society. And I guess, yeah, that was something that I'm quite keen to be part of. So. I guess I kind of just took it from there and went forward with that. What do I enjoy most? Well, I guess um, I just I find the, the parasite really fascinating, um, mostly because um, I haven't told you about this yet, but it's associated with a huge variety of different uh, mental health conditions. Um, so schizophrenia is one of them. People with T. gondii infection are high risk of developing schizophrenia. And also some really quirky ones, you know, it can change your personality in certain ways um, and even increase your risk of having a, a traffic accident. Um, so I think it's just a really fascinating parasite. And I think because of its, all these different effects that it has in humans, um, people come from lots of different scientific fields um, to try to understand it. So for example, you have not only parasitic, parasitologists and epidemiologists, but you also have people from neuroscience, for example, and behavioral sciences, all kind of working together on different projects and collaborating, trying to understand more about the parasite. So I think there's definitely that aspect of just wanting to understand the parasite, but also um, I really enjoyed the modeling and, and learning new skills there. Um, and I guess it's just a bonus if it's kind of towards something for the greater good. So. Well, I think for this particular strand of research, um, we'd like to, to take it abroad. So we have some, uh, some collaborators at the University of Montreal in Canada, um, who are also working on Toxoplasma. 
um, and they were really keen to collaborate and to try and develop this um, antibody test further. Um, because the problem is at the moment only one laboratory group in the whole world actually know how to use it, so it's not very accessible to lots of people. So we'd like to kind of bring that to the wider research community. Um, so maybe I'd, I'd fly over and go to the lab for a few months. Um, obviously at the moment that kind of depends on, on how the COVID outbreak progresses and the restrictions in place there. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the first port of, port of call and I, I think if we can get that up and running there's lots of other opportunities down the line for epidemiological surveys and all sorts of interesting stuff, so I'm really looking forward to that. Well, so obviously the next steps for me are to complete my PhD. Um, I'm only two years in, so I've got two years left, I'm halfway. Um, so I don't really want to have to rush through that. Um, I'm quite keen to use it as just a learning experience and get as much as I can out of it. Um, but afterwards, I kind of have thought about possibly staying in academia. Um, I know lots of PhD students say that halfway through and maybe they go towards industry later on, but I, I'm hoping stay in academia and do a postdoc. So that's just a job where you stay in research, you have a bit more independence. Um, and that could be working on Tactoxoplasma, or it could be um, working on a completely different pathogen or parasite altogether, um, and maybe even at a different research institution. But I think, yeah, staying in academia, working on infectious diseases, and I'd really like to continue with the modeling. I just, I find it's a really interesting tool and very useful for, for these sorts of things. So. Well, I would say if you're um, if you're a student and you're considering whether to do a science degree, for example, um, what I did is just try and get as much experience as I could. You know, it doesn't have to be anything heavy duty. It could be just work shadowing. Uh, if you know someone who does something in science, just dropping them a phone call or a text and just asking if, if you could maybe shadow them or see what they do on a day to day basis. Um, there are also more formal things so you could apply for student internships um, and I think it's so that would be useful just not only for the kind of bulking out your CV and making it look more impressive so when you apply to things you'll be more likely to get in but I think also just to give you an idea of like the variety of things that are out there the science isn't this one track thing that you have to be stuck in the lab I and mean, there are lots of different possibilities um, and I, so I think it will give you a flavour of that um, and so yeah, I, I think that's probably probably my advice, just try lots of things, see what you like, maybe read some pop science. Um, I read a great book called Spillover by David Quarman, and I, that kind of drew me more towards infectious diseases as well. So just kind of keep your, keep your eyes open and do some reading and yeah, I think hopefully you'll find something you enjoy.